Well, welcome back to this episode. Uh, we are uh, going to be talking today about uh, our biggest fears put to rest. And in, I know uh, many of you saw some of the launch uh, information that I had put out about um, a new location where we were going to broadcast live this Friday. Um, and unfortunately, it turned out <laughs> that... Uh, COVID-19 um, changed everybody's plans. Um, if you haven't heard, obviously, there's a pandemic going on. And, uh, and that's actually going to be one of the parts of the subject that we're going to talk about. Our biggest fears put to rest. That's what I've called this message. Our biggest fears put to rest. And essentially what I want to do is I want to give security and comfort back to you. Security and comfort. Through this message... Uh, that's what we're seeking to do. Now, like yourself, you probably uh, have uh, had some radical changes in life lately. Uh, every day seems to be a new adventure. We're, we're getting new information, new studies. Everything is changing dramatically and fastly, right? <coughs> well, as I was dealing with that as well and, and you know, I was supposed to, last time I put a, a video out was a month ago. And I was going to put out uh, this next one as a launch. I, I started this ministry with um, just putting on some videos on, online through a site that I already had, a page on Facebook. That page was, uh, was, uh, was Jesus is Moving. And then um, that was a little too churchy for me. Uh, I usually uh, feel like I reach the people that are not in the church a lot better. And that was my goal, uh, according to what I felt God calling me to. So therefore, <clears throat> I changed the name to something that suited me a little bit better, as well as represented what this is about a little bit better. And that was Wounded for War. So I started a Facebook page called Wounded for War. I started releasing the videos on both of them. And uh, it, it gained some ground. And, but then what happened was I moved, felt like I needed to move it to YouTube. So I moved it there. So now we got some, some steps that I've taken. And then a door opened where someone offered a 3,000 square foot facility um, to do a live broadcast that seats 300 people. We could do an event there. We had planned it. We were going to do it uh, Friday night. Unfor unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, and I have, uh, um, well, I have respiratory problems, severe. I take a bunch of uh, asthmatic um, uh, um, steroids and whatnot to keep my breathing alive. That's what you're going to hear. It's a little cold in here right now. You're going to hear me cough a few times. I don't have the COVID. I have asthma, okay? <coughs> I also have a thing called vocal cord dysfunction, but essentially it has to do with breathing more than anything. Um, but yeah, so I have that. I have high blood pressure as well as, I forget the third one, but I'm pretty much a marker for all three uh, underlying uh, health issues. Uh, my son has a tumor in his leg. Uh, if you want an update on that, uh, here's uncertainty for you. Uh, they, they, we were right up to the point where they were supposed to schedule my son. He has a rare tumor in his leg. If you're just tuning into this, he's 15 years old and this is the second time the tumor came back. We're supposed to have this thing pulled out right away and then put it into pathology, find out what it was, whether it's cancer or not, what, what, what the deal is, right? And unfortunately, <clears throat> right before they scheduled it, the pandemic hit. And so now we've been told that we don't know what's going to happen. They're just letting the tumor grow in his leg. Um, it's growing in the bone, and it last time was about to break the bone open, and that's in his leg, the large bone. So <clears throat> basically, we don't know what the end is, and we don't know how much harm this tumor is doing to my son. All that to say, this has left every one of us in uncertain times. And so I felt, as I prayed and sought the Lord, that uh, a message on uh, fear turning into security and um, how does God comfort us in those times was going to be very important. And so um, our biggest fears put to rest is what I've titled this. Now we're going to jump in. Um, you know, the fear of the unknown, if you think about it, is uh, greater than the impact on society 
uh, than the virus itself so far. You have tons of people out there, and we've watched the news, everybody has. Uh, you know, people have done, some, some people, we see the videos of people in Italy, and they're playing music outside the window, and they're, they're, they're into it deeper. They're past the, the panic point. They realize it's set, they've settled in. They've been locked down for a month. They kind of know life as normal now. You know how they say, uh, if you want to change a habit, it takes 30 days. Well, guess what? They're 30 days into this. They kind of, it's normal for them a bit, right? <coughs> well, so they're ahead of us. But here in the U.S., um, we're only a few weeks into this. And so everyone's in full panic mode. I heard of a story uh, up nearby us in uh, just the outskirts of Seattle where someone was at a grocery store and the line was obviously... Uh, ridiculously long and it got so bad that this guy you know as everybody has been talking about the the toilet paper missing and there's not enough toilet paper and people panicked and grabbed a bunch well this guy really got upset and pulled a gun on um, people in that store because he needed toilet paper that's how crazy the impact of the fear of the unknown can have on people well we know that um, long lines, aggravated people, you know, things of that nature that this kind of brings about uh, definitely changes people into more of a mob mentality. They have this um, mob mentality that, that on a large scale, when people are in fear, they tend to do things they normally wouldn't. Well, you know, there's an illustration I wanted to use uh, about Disney, but my wife said it wasn't a good one during this time. But you understand what it's like to see a mob mentality. You understand what it's like to see um, people do things that they normally wouldn't. I would imagine. We've all ran across that scenario in our life. We see it right now, right in front of us. <coughs> day in and day out, people are doing things they wouldn't normally do. This means that we should be aware of something. We really should ask ourselves something, a question that's really worth asking. And that's, is our fears worth being afraid of? But to do this honestly, to ask yourself that question honestly you got to think for yourself. You got to let go of the mob mentality for a minute. You have to step away mentally, shut off everything else that's going on. I know that's hard to do right now. But you have to you have to kind of ask the honest question within your heart, is my fear worth fearing? Well, <coughs> It would help us to understand what really that mob mentality is and how it works for us to step away from it. And that's essentially what is mob mentality? A behavior, this is uh, Wikipedia says, a behavior in which people act the same way or adopt similar behaviors as people around them, often ignoring their own feelings in the process. So... With that as our foundation, let's look at that really important question. Are my fears worth fearing? Most of our fears are rooted in control, right? Um, or the lack thereof, I should say. I don't know about you, but don't you feel a little bit more afraid when you think things are out of your control? Uh, I know <coughs> that... Uh, for instance, when, when I'm in the, my car and I'm behind this, the steering wheel, I feel pretty comfortable. When my wife is in the car and I'm in the passenger seat and everything feels out of control, I'm in panic mode, right? So <laughs> I, I know that then the opposite is. So then fear raises when we feel out of control. COVID-19, all it did is it brought all of our fears to the front of our mind. 
Are we going to have enough food? Are we going to uh, die? One of the biggest fears that anybody has, fear of death. And so what really um, we have to look at is, is that control element to understand our fears. We don't have control. We're going we're gonna to panic. We have con- if we feel like we have control, we, t- we tend not to have fear or panic. We've made comfort our goal in, in this last, I would say this last 10 years has been after 08 happened and we kind of saw a shift uh, financially in the, in the market and the world started to go back to somewhat a normal place. <clears throat> what happened? We saw people um, getting a, lo- a lot more comfortable, right? Um, we're working really hard on the lives that we want. And then all of a sudden, that comfort, that guarantee of our future by COVID-19, it just got stripped away instantaneously. And so what it does is it, it shakes what we thought we were in control of. I think, though, that there's a way that we can actually gain back that control. Well, not the control, but the control of our fear. And that we have to do by looking at the Word of God. Because the Word of God declares that all of everything that goes on is a part of God's plan. And I know right now some of you didn't like hearing that. Because immediately it raises, wait, he's in control of this virus. And people are dying. Why is he not doing anything? Right? And I understand that and we'll address that in a moment. (coughs) You know... Here's the one thing, though, that to keep in mind about control. Though you may not be in control, how about when you know the person in control? Like the car illustration. I know my wife. That's part of the reason why I'm not uh, very comfortable when she's driving. Because I know her tendencies. And it's scary. But what if you knew the individual and that individual them being in control was a good thing. There's people that I would get behind the wheel with, let them drive, and I could even fall asleep because I know them. I know that they operate. I know that I'm safe. So knowing the individual that is in control can also then bring peace, some comfort. So what do we know about the one in control? Well, if we can look at all the ways uh, that God, there's, there's lots of areas in the Bible that talk about who he is and what he does and, and how he works, and we can look at him and his character and nature. Today I want to look at all the way in the, back in the beginning. There's a, a book called Genesis. It's the very start of humanity. It's the very start of uh, Christianity and humanity and and how God put all of this into motion. And if we look at it for two blissful chapters, everything's wonderful in the world. But then in chapter three of Genesis, something happens. A new voice comes in. That voice, uh, it only takes one voice, by the way, to change anybody's circumstance, to put them into a panic or to calm them down. In this case, it was Satan. Satan causes Adam and Eve to question the plan of God for their life. You know, they had all that they needed. They were in the Garden of Eden. All the food they wanted. It says that they were friendship with God, that they would walk in the morning, in the cool of the morning. They had friendship. <coughs> they had companionship with each other. They had food. They had everything that they needed. God had provided. They even had a good job. Gave them the uh, opportunity to till the land and name animals. And how cool, right? Aardvark. I don't know where you come up with that, looking at that animal, but all right. Or giraffe, uh, you know. <coughs> he did all this stuff. Adam and Eve, um, he and she were, were out there in the most perfect environment for them. And the one question 
that comes about in, in that moment came from Satan and it changed life forever. Did God actually say? That's what Satan starts with. Did God actually say? Causing that, 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 that's a question to cause doubt, right? That's the very first voice that causes doubt, fear, shame, all sorts of stuff. We'll see why. You see, that one question changed everything, but then he moves to the next level. Satan steps it up and he says <clears throat> that, uh, for God knows that when you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be opened. So he caused doubt in Eve. He caused her to question God. And then he actually spins that truth and into a lie and says, hey, by the way, God's holding back on you. God had given them all that they needed. Blissful first two chapters. And God makes an accusation that or sorry, Satan makes an accusation that God was holding out on them. Caused doubt and then made an accusation. God's holding out on you. They went from listening to one voice, right? One person listening to one voice to that one person that listened to it, spreading that into another person's mind. And then they both acted on it and ate the fruit, right? And then from that moment forward, they had repercussions. Have you listened to someone and ever acted on it only to find out later that you only had half of the information? I know I have and I regretted it. It's usually the case, right? We usually regret those sort of moments where we found out we only had half the information. We acted on it anyhow. At this point, to be honest with you, if I'm God, I'm hitting a reset button. It'd be easy, right? There's only two of them. Nobody else will know. Delete. Start over. But that is not what we see God doing. Not at all. As a matter of fact, at this point, God enters back onto the scene. And we see that basically... What he does is instead of hitting the, the delete button, he actually shows his heart towards all humanity that is off track. Why do I say off track? Well, you see, when we are not following God's plan for our life, the Bible uses the word sinned. It's actually an archery term, and it's used to describe to miss the mark. And that's all it is, to miss the mark. I know a lot of people use that word sinned, and it's got a negative connotation. It just actually means that you missed the mark, that you've gotten off course somehow. So how does God deal with a person that has missed the mark? Let's look at what he does with Adam and Eve. In this moment, Adam and Eve had felt afraid. It says that they noticed in uh, chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So what's God's first action for someone who sinned or missed the mark? He covered their shame. You see, for the very first time in verse 25 of chapter 2, it says, The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This was before they made the mistake. They're not ashamed. But then somehow, when they end up in front of the situation, and they've actually missed the mark or they've done something wrong, 
It says that they sewed fig leaves or sewed leaves together to cover themselves. And God goes in and sees them, and he says, I'm going to make a more co- permanent covering for you. He didn't beat up on them. He didn't reprimand them. <coughs> what did he do? He made a covering for them. He cared for their need. He covered their shame. You know, verse 10 in chapter uh, 3 tells us that they experienced fear for the very first time when they knew that they, they, they were outside of God's plan for their life. Literally, in that moment where they hear him in the cool of the morning coming out to talk like he had normally done, they're freaking out. They have panic. That's the first time man ever experienced fear, by the way. God chooses to put a more permanent covering over them. But to do so, he had to make a sacrifice. He had to sacrifice the very first animal to actually cover their sin this isn't approval of what they did this isn't approval at all this is not God approving sin but more God showing his heart as a good dad to his creation and letting him know that he loves them You see, God understands how good the enemy of our life is at deceiving us. In uh, chapter 3, verse 13, he says that uh, the woman ends, I should say, actually, that with the comment, the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So God knows that the enemy is very good at deceiving at this point, it's a great opportunity to ask the question of ourself. How have we been deceived or how are we being deceived? You see, one of the best things about this COVID-19, there's always good that can come out of bad, is that it caused all of us to slow down our busy, distracted lives. The times where everything's going good, I'm just ste- checking my stocks and, and I'm, I'm doing my job and I'm looking for the next elevation in my, my position at work and, <clears throat> you know, I got to put it in my time at the gym and then I got to make sure my social life is on point. All of that's put on hold. It gives us time to contemplate what's most important and is everything that I'm doing, everything that I'm pursuing, is it really worth it? if it can all be stripped away in a moment. You know, many of us from 08 to now got right back on track to (coughs) rebuild our wealth, right? And we thought probably many of us in the last few years, man, I'm right back on track. Things are looking good. But even this COVID-19 proved to us again that trusting in our wealth isn't where we should be trusting. Or, you know, how about, I mean, it's obvious, the health. This thing can knock anyone out. Some people even trust in things like religion. Truth be told, religion is another set of rules to obtain, according to Webster's Dictionary, it's a set of rules to obtain a good standing or right standing with a God. That's just more work. It's another to-do list. That's not going to work. Just like the covering that God made for Adam and Eve. He made a covering for us. You see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You see, God covers our shame. He gives a clear understanding that he has a covering for us that a sacrifice was made for us, for our missing the mark, 
so that we could be right back in unity with the creator that created us so that we could be actually back on track to the mark that he had created us for. So if this message hit you and uh, it tugged at your heart to make a choice to change your direction in life, to see what the possibilities look like if you follow Jesus, then I would invite you to step into uh, that place of, of admitting like, like Eve did. I've been deceived. And allow God to give you the grace in that moment and to cover you through Jesus Christ. So if that's you, talk to him. Pray. That's all that is. Talk to him and ask God, I acknowledge 100% that I've been on the wrong path, that I've been focused on the wrong things, that, that I've been pursuing my dreams my way. And, and I acknowledge that you have a plan for my life. And if you do, I want to see what that is. So I give you control. I give you over my fears. I give you my shame, my, everything that I've done. And I just ask that you would show me what your best is for my life. If you do that, he will answer your prayer. Continue to uh, come back and watch these videos if you want to grow in that new faith. We're going to be talking about various things uh, each time I release a video. It'll always be geared around who God is what his plan is for your life and how to follow him to gain that best life for you. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.